Thank you so much, Lee, for that kind introduction, and good morning. It is so wonderful to see so many familiar faces uh, here at Commercial UAV Expo this year, and so many new faces as well. So welcome, and I'm so glad that you're all here. I know that COVID has been a tough time for all of us, certainly, uh, including all of us here in this room, and it's energizing for me to really get to be here with you all in person. and see you here at the show. I've been so, in speaking of COVID, I've been so inspired by this industry's initiative to stand up and try to help during this time of crisis. So thank you all. My name is Lisa Elman, and I wear two hats in this industry, as Lee noted. I chair the global UAS practice group at Hogan Lovell's law firm, and I co-founded and serve as the executive director of the Commercial Drone Alliance. So just so I can get a sense of who's here in this room, uh, how many here are active members of the commercial drone industry? Okay. All right. Lots of us. Manufacturers? Okay, several. Operators? All right. End users? Software developers? Drone security companies? <laughs> okay, good. Well, we have the whole ecosystem here. And it's so amazing to see you all here in one space. Now, for those of you not yet familiar with the Commercial Drone Alliance, we're an independent nonprofit organization focused on moving our industry forward. We're led by key leaders in the commercial drone industry. I'll give a quick shout out to our board of directors, which include Wing Aviation, Skydio, Zipline, New Air, Aloft, Choctaw Nation, SkySafe, and Percepto. I think most of you all are, are, are here today, so hopefully we can all see each other. The CDA brings together commercial drone end users, manufacturers, service providers, advanced air mobility companies, and drone security companies. We represent virtually all vertical market sectors serviced by the drone industry, including oil and gas, and precision agriculture, communications infrastructure, uh, and technology, security, construction, news gathering, filmmaking, and so much more. We work with all levels of government, including the White House, the FAA, Department of Transportation, and NASA, the national security agencies, and the broader executive branch to collaborate on policies for industry growth. We educate the public on the countless public benefits, which you're all completely aware of, uh, and essential services that drones provide to the American public, whether delivering critical supplies or life-saving medicines and commercial products or improving safety and efficiency through criti critical infrastructure, inspections at scale, and supporting our first responders, and so much more. The Commercial Drone Alliance's Alliance focuses on enabling innovation in commercial drones, and we've been incredibly active this year on behalf of our industry. With a new administration in place in DC, there's been a lot going on. We've sought to educate the new political leadership on the immense safety and health and environmental and security and equity and economic benefits of the commercial drone industry. We have worked with government officials to promote US leadership in global aviation and to enable the American public to realize the many benefits of UAS. We're working with White House stakeholders to understand policy implications for the commercial drone industry. We're seeking the nomination of a White House Chief Technology Officer, given the importance of the Office of Science and Technology Policy to UAS integration, as well as a White House Summit on UAS. We're lobbying Congress for infrastructure proposals focused on expanding the use of drones to inspect America's aging infrastructure and modernizing our nation's digital infrastructure to help promote worker safety, protect the environment, and increase efficiencies. We're responding to and commenting on draft legislation at the federal, state, and local levels that many of you are seeing popping up that would impact in some way uh, the growth of the commercial drone industry. We're engaging with the Federal Communications Commission on key issues including broad spectrum access and experimental licenses for drone security technology research and development. 
We're seeking immediate next steps on remote identification, including focus on enabling a network-based approach. And of course, we're bringing our industry together here at Commercial UAV Expo. I encourage all of you to get to know each other, especially given we're finally able to all be here in person, and you're the, really the cream of the crop in this industry. Our goal each year is to bring together the smartest and brightest and most innovative in the industry, and to curate and promote conversations that move our industry forward. We want to hear from you. I really can't wait to learn from you all here at this conference. What do your companies need in order to scale? How is, do you see the technology evolving year after year? What are the biggest changes, for example, since we were all together last in person that you see, and where do you see the technologies going? How does the policy environment impact market success? And how can policymakers and regulators and innovators all work together to enable this industry to thrive safely and securely? And how can the commercial drone industry leverage the diversity of our industries to drive innovation? We're going to discuss what's around the corner, what's happening in DC that affects your businesses, and how your businesses can succeed in a regulated marketplace. And as you all know, 2021 is the year of, an, of enabling beyond visual line of sight. All right, let's hear it. I mean, how, how many of you need beyond visual line of sight in order to be able to scale your operations, right? Exactly, the holy grail of our industry. Because while the, we have, there are so many amazing benefits to the commercial drone use and commercial drone industry for the American public, but current FAA regulations do not broadly enable our domestic drone beyond visual line of sight industry to scale and regulations to enable it are still a little ways off. The existing aviation framework either assumes a pilot on board the aircraft or makes it extremely difficult, as we all know, for UAS market participants to adapt. So this summer, the FAA launched the Beyond Visual Line of Sight Aviation Rulemaking Committee, which I know many of you are involved with. And the Commercial Drone Alliance is actually leading a working group of this committee focused on industry market drivers. What does our industry need from a market perspective in order to be able to scale beyond visual line of sight operations? So this arc marks a critical and important step forward in bringing the FAA and other executive branch agencies together with industry and state and local governments and other relevant stakeholders to move UAS policymaking forward so businesses can succeed here in the United States. From our own perspective, the CDA is focused on bringing stakeholders together to solve these tough challenges and help businesses like yours to scale here in the United States just like you're doing in countries around the world. For example, we're working to educate federal policymakers on relevant differences between the drone marketplace and the legacy aviation marketplace, as well as between drone operations and manned aviation operations, just, um, you know, and what that ought to mean for policy and regulation. As you all know, the drone marketplace is designed differently and funded differently from the legacy aviation marketplace. And it should be regulated appropriately in a risk-based, performance-based way. We're focusing on enabling autonomy. We're promoting the need for regulatory flexibility, predictability, certainty, and stability for the marketplace. We're working hard to develop the policy, legal, and regulatory frameworks in the US that will enable our industry to thrive and ensure that the US does not lose our, lo our long and well-established role as leader in aviation throughout the world. Now, like I said, we're at a unique time in a new administration where policymakers are getting engaged and getting educated. We met with the Biden-Harris transition team. We're meeting with the new political appointees to communicate what our industry needs and why it's in the federal government's best interest to provide it. I would urge all of us in this room recognizing that this is how we need to be able to scale our industry, and these efforts are so important. I would urge all of you to get involved, whether through CDA or other organizations, um, and if you're not involved with CDA, uh, you know, please join our cause. 
You can find out more at commercialdronealliance.org. And now we have an exciting program, kicked off by some amazing keynotes this morning. To start, I am honored to introduce the FAA Administrator, Steve Dixon. Administrator Dixon has served as the FAA Administrator since August of 2019. Prior to joining the FAA, Administrator Dixon was a pilot in the Air Force where he flew the T-38 Talon supersonic jet trainer and F-15 Eagle fighter jet. He also spent almost 30 years at Delta Airlines, first as a pilot and most recently as the Senior Vice President of Flight Operations. As an advocate for commercial aviation safety, he has served as chairman of several industry stakeholder groups. And now, Administrator Dixon is a champion for safe drone technology and the aviation innovation occurring in our exciting industry. Administrator Dixon, we are so grateful for your leadership and for your engagement with us. Thank you for being here. Please join me in welcoming FAA Administrator Steve Dixon. Well, thanks, Lisa, and good morning, everyone. I think, uh, actually, I could have written your speech because uh, my message really is very similar. Uh, it's, it's about getting involved. Uh, you know, and it really is good for the soul uh, to be together. This, this is one of the most important events uh, that I felt it was necessary that we had direct FAA participation in this year. And uh, really glad to be here and for all of us to be together in person. And I want to thank all of you for being here. You know, your presence, uh, your leadership, uh, your engagement uh, speak volumes to me, and it's, uh, it's so important uh, to the innovation that's going on uh, right now and to the U.S.'s uh, continued uh, global leadership in uh, aviation and aerospace. Of course, over the last 18 months, as we all know, a lot of these events have had to go virtual. Uh, but our work to move forward together to safely scale and uh, integrate routine drone operations into the national airspace has continued at a rapid pace. In many respects, uh, you know, I actually think this is uh, the most exciting period in aviation aerospace history. Uh, for example, in the commercial space world, uh, the Office of Commercial Space has existed at the FAA for over 37 years now. In the first eight months of this year, We've had 41 FAA license launches, and we're on track for between 60 and 70 by year's end, more than one a week. It just really boggles the mind. So that 41 is fully 10% of the total in the FAA Office of Commercial Space's entire history. And we'll soon see a cadence of more than 100 commercial launches a year. Uh, and so it just really, this innovation just continues to drive uh, the aerospace sector. Of course, we have one national airspace system that we, have to, that we have to share and that we have to manage. So there are tremendous opportunities, and certainly the world of drones uh, and commercial applications, uh, that world is, is really no different in that respect. So we've accomplished a lot uh, in our journey together over the last few years, but as we know, and I think as Lisa highlighted, uh, there are some important uh, milestones behind us in the recent past, but some po important work uh, to do together uh, to, to basically get the value uh, out of the technology and the capability that we all want. And I don't have to tell anyone here that the pace of that innovation is picking up. But before the program started, uh, we were talking here as we were uh, getting ready to set the stage up. and. Some of the folks who have been at these events over the years were talking about how many new innovations uh, were out on the floor this year uh, and were available than just you know, a year ago. And it's just incredible to see uh, all of that happening. So it's great to be here, to see everyone, and see the exciting trends and innovation that's happening uh, in the drone space. Now, as everyone knows, I spend a lot of my time at FAA headquarters in Washington. Uh, but my wife and I have a home in Atlanta and uh, our adult children and our grandchildren actually live there. So I'm plugged in uh, to some things that are going on. My son actually has his own videography business. He just got his Part 107 license uh, renewed and uh, showed, showed me his new license with uh, my signature at the bottom of it. So I'm, I'm pretty, uh, pretty familiar with, uh, with what's going on. And uh, at Georgia Tech, there's a great example of some, uh, some creative thinking 
They are conducting some important research on drone package delivery. And this work has garnered some recent attention. Some of you may be familiar with it. They're actually testing how several small drones can swarm together to carry heavier packages. Working in tandem, the small drones can support a package to and from a person's home, often in a safer and quieter way than a single larger drone. Now this approach, you know, is a, is a new idea. It could be a game changer. Instead of just small packages, drones could deliver just about anything. And not just to a person's house. Obviously, we see these kinds of applications uh, in resupplying troops in a combat zone, for example. So, you know, pretty impressive stuff and just a small example of the kind of things that we see going on. This research at Georgia Tech is, a, as I said, a great example of how the drone community is really on the cutting edge. And it gives us a glimpse at how drones can offer tremendous value uh, to our society. At the FAA, we're focused on establishing drone policy that ensures safe integration into the airspace system, but at the same time doesn't stifle uh, the advances and the innovation uh, that we see happening at places like Georgia Tech and many of the folks in this room. The public uh, perception, though, fully expects all aspects of aviation to be as safe as commercial airlines have become. Uh, we've gotten spoiled a bit over the last uh, 20 to 25 years. And so if we all don't understand, businesses and operators who don't understand those expectations are just not going to be able to be in business for very long. And so we all need to understand how we manage that risk and move forward safely uh, but briskly. So how do we, uh, the FAA and the federal government, fairly and equitably integrate all this technology into our national airspace system and do it in a safe and predictable way uh, so that we can move forward? Well, as the FAA administrator, I see policy and the accompanying regulations as sort of like a safety envelope. You could call it an operating envelope for an airplane, a protective sphere uh, around the machine, around the vehicle. The envelope gives the operator a comfort zone within which he or she can be assured of a safe operation before reaching the edge of the envelope where safety, yours and the public's, might be compromised. For drone integration, we've done our best to allow for as much development and operational work as possible flying under the existing regs, uh, again, within our existing regulatory framework. But we've had to make some changes occasionally to make sure that the protective envelope is as robust as it needs to, meet, to be. And we're at the point right now to continue to move forward that we're bumping up against the edges of the envelope in some cases. So there are some very important and groundbreaking performance-based rules on the horizon, especially in relation to beyond visual line of sight operations or, as we know, BV loss, uh, and also in the area of drone certification. Now, before we talk about that, let's take a little walk around memory lane and talk about how we got here. Policy on drones actually uh, began about 40 years ago when the FAA issued Advisory Circular 91-57. This circular outlined certain operating standards for model aircraft and encouraged voluntary compliance with safety standards. Now all was relatively quiet in the space until about 2012 when the small drone industry suddenly uh, came to life. And suddenly there was a need to make sure that we had a protective envelope around an entirely new kind of aviation vehicle. Congress, for its part, required the FAA to create a way to authorize these so-called non-hobby drone operations and set out methods to obtain waivers or exemptions uh, for these operations. The law also created the small UAS classification for drones weighing less than 55 pounds. Now we followed up in 2015 with registration marking rules that everyone's familiar with and guidance for small drones. The idea, again, has been to link the operator uh, to the aircraft. In 2016 came the publishment of uh, Part 107, a small UAS rule, and that created the remote pilot certificate that I talked about a minute ago. Part 107 also set operational standards for commercial small drone flights. And then now we fast forward to January of 2021 which was the next milestone in the journey, 
And that's where we expanded the protective envelope with two more rules. And it was not a linear path to get there, but we got there. First, we published a rule that modified Part 107 to allow routine operations over people and also routine operations at night under certain circumstances. Second, we published the first version of the remote identification rule, which has compliance dates of September of 2022 for manufacturers and September of 23 for remote pilots. Now, with respect to night operations, I want to emphasize that Part 107 pilots still have to complete the new online training course and equip with uh, the proper anti-collision lighting to be able to uh, enable those operations. Now, working with industry, we've also done a great deal to make public, the public comfortable with the technology, uh, and particularly over the past year, when drones displayed, displayed uh, tremendous capability and unique value during the pandemic. The package delivery companies, in particular, were innovative and flexible, modifying their services to deliver medications, supplies, food, PPE, vaccines, and even school books. News stories about drones for good. This was a big theme that we were using about this time last year. These efforts uh, help pr promote public acceptance of drones. This is all great progress uh, for the industry, but much of this foundation has been built up to this point through waivers uh, for drone operations on a case-by-case -case basis. And we know that that's not going to be sustainable. So that's why we're at this inflection point where we find ourselves. Waivers are, of course, are ad hoc and not scalable across the national aviation system. So if the industry is going to grow, there needs to be a standard set of rules for beyond visual line of sight operations. And we're very well aware of that. So we're working closely with the drone community to do it right and to make sure that we take all uh, stakeholder perspectives into account. I'll talk more about that in a moment. Now let me move uh, to the machine itself. We're also at the same time evolving the way that we uh, certify certain drones through the Mosaic Rule, which uh, as you may know, stands for Modernization of Special Airworthiness Certificates. Now there are aspects of Mosaic that get into uh, experimental aircraft that are beyond the scope specifically of UAS, and Mosaic is still in development. But we envision a day when we can enable more drone operations by appropriately scaling our aircraft cert requirements according to the risk of the operation that's being undertaken. Now, we won't develop these rules in a vacuum. It's really important that all of you stay engaged and that you're all at the table. So it might be helpful to pause just for a second and think about how the rules for the operator, the vehicle, and the airspace interact with each other. And I always think about three uh, interlocking circles. You know, in manned aviation, we've got requirements for pilots to earn their certificates, and then we have operating rules that they have to, uh, to live by. Then we have another circle with the airspace rules that govern how to operate safely in the airspace. And then finally, we have rules that place requirements on aircraft manufacturers. Think of these three interlocking circles and how that architecture provides us with the aviation system and the level of safety that we enjoy today. Well, really the same construct applies to drones, if you think about it. Except in this case, obviously, the aviator is not aboard the aircraft. But there's still training to be done and requirements that must be met. It's just through a different pathway. Same thing goes for the machine and the airspace. We really want to think about how these, uh, how these uh, different domains interact with each other. And there, is, there are some differences uh, in, in how we look at these issues when it comes to uh, drones versus manned aviation. But this construct does define the task that we have before us for safe, scalable, and routine drone operations. Of course, it's easier said than done. Uh, many competing interests and sometimes tension between different sectors of the industry. So getting us all on the same page is not going to be easy, uh, but it's extremely important. In fact, when we proposed the rule for remote ID, I think as everyone knows, that was a very painful process. We got more than 53,000 comments. We read and adjudicated every one of them. Uh, that shows you that the drone industry is diverse. I've seen this in 
when I've been involved in aviation rulemaking committees and federal advisory committees uh, for uh, commercial aviation. Different operators have different business models and all of those interests need to be reconciled so that we can uh, have consensus standards uh, that are developed to be able to move the entire sector uh, uh, forward together. So there are many different con uh, concepts for drones of operations, different vehicle capabilities, each of which may entail different levels of safety risk. The challenge is to have the rulemaking done in, in such a way that we don't end up with the least common denominator because that's not what anyone wants. There are sometimes these competing interests, as I said, among different sectors, and we've got to be careful not to look, be parochial and look at things only from our own vantage point uh, because then what ends up happening is the FAA ends up getting caught in the middle and not being able to please anyone. So at the end of the day, you really not everyone will get exactly what they want, but we want to find solutions that hopefully everyone will agree are best for the industry as a whole, will provide the most value to the community, uh, and an acceptable level of safety for the aviation system. So that's the approach that we're taking to create policy for routine, scalable, beyond visual line of sight operations. Now in June, this took longer than I wanted to to get set up, but in June, we stood up the uh, Aviation Rulemaking Committee, or ARC. We selected 90 members, and they started work immediately. And we've got some great people and some great representatives uh, on the ARC. They're looking closely at the safety, security, environmental, and other policy needs, as well as societal benefits of these operations. Now, getting 90 individuals from the drone community, all with somewhat different interests, and sometimes, again, there's some tension between those different perspectives. By asking them to come to a consensus is, is certainly not an easy task, especially in the six-month time frame that we gave them. But I can tell you that I've been very impressed with how the group got started, and I've been keeping very close track on their progress. I want to uh, actually right now give a shout out to the committee's industry co-chairs for their leadership. Uh, Eileen Lockhart from Excel Energy, and uh, my old friend Sean Cassidy from Amazon Prime Air. They have done an outstanding job of setting the table and the expectations and driving the work uh, along with uh, all the, uh, the subcommittee leaderships uh, as well. Now later this year, around the Thanksgiving time frame, we should receive the committee's final recommendations, and that'll help us draft uh, the rule for BB loss. This should result in more predictability for drone manufacturers and operators, which in turn will pave the way for routine package delivery, infrastructure inspection, and other more complex drone operations beyond the visual line of sight of the remote pilot. Now we're also continuing and actually evolving uh, some programs that we had uh, going for the last several years to continue to develop uh, capabilities and drone applications. For example, uh, our research and partner program, uh, BEYOND, which I know many of you are participating in. Uh, BEYOND is helping us create performance-based technology agnostic rules as well. BEYOND picks up where the integration pilot program, which you may remember we called it the IPP for short, where it left off a couple of years ago. We're working with eight of the nine IPP participants and some new partners over the next several years to advance and expand the scope of repeatable and scalable BV loss operations under today's rules. Now there's also a great deal of additional research underway through our government, industry, academic, and international partners. And we're well-funded and well-resourced for that work to continue. Topics of high interest and ongoing work include passenger transport capabilities, such as urban air mobility. We're also studying the risks of drones, including ground and uh, airborne collision severity studies, engine ingestion testing, and UAS detection, uh, which we're testing right now at five airports over the next two years. And what we're looking at here is really the, com the compatibility uh, between these detection platforms and our air traffic control and airport uh, technology and infrastructure that's out there now. Now, as everyone knows, the FAA is not only a regulator, but we are uh, an operator ourselves. We're like many of you. 
uh, because we are the air navigation services provider for the United States and for the oceanic areas that we have delegated uh, to us. So of course, we're heavily invested as an operator in making sure that the drone ecosystem will fit hand in glove with our air traffic control system. And our answer is what you all know as UTM, UAS Traffic Management. It's the foundational capability that's needed to unlock the full potential of the drone sector. And based on the collaborative work that we have done with NASA, uh, we're planning a regulatory framework that will allow airspace users to cooperatively manage their operations where the FAA does not actively provide separation services. We're also continuing to work with our global partners to develop a UTM architecture. But ultimately, we want you, industry, to take ownership of this effort. And when I see all the amazing innovation from private industry shaping the aerospace industry right now, I'm confident that UTM will be no different. When you envision the types of airplanes moving through the skies under UTM, you not only think of BV loss, cargo delivery flights, but you naturally think of things like advanced air mobility or what a lot of people call flying taxis. Now, we've seen some of the prototypes. I saw a prototype recently uh, actually flying up at Oshkosh, and it's hard not to be excited about what we see. As I noted earlier, uh, my role as FAA administrator is to figure out how to support these emerging technologies while maintaining the unwavering safety commitment that the public has come to expect from the FAA. Finding this balance is especially challenging because AAM crosses so many domains, regulations, infrastructure, technology, operations, and societal perceptions. So we are taking a systems approach and an enterprise-wide approach. No longer can we give approvals and look at issues by individual FAA line of business. We really have to take a holistic enterprise approach to these issues. So for AAM, we've established an internal uh, integration executive council that will coordinate all activities in five areas, aircraft, airspace, operations, infrastructure, and community. We're also working with NASA on the Advanced Air Mobility National Campaign, and this is designed to help develop certification standards while promoting public confidence and education in the benefits of the technology. All of us, government, industry, and the public, have a role to play as we develop consensus standards and a comprehensive risk picture of how and where AAM will operate. Now, this is not something that's five or 10 years in the future. We've got several AAM aircraft in the aircraft certification process right now. And several companies anticipate flying initial AAM operations in the year 2024. So this is really right around the corner. The FAA really, at this point, because of the initial concepts of operations, will be able to operate with the flexibility provided by our existing rules. But there will be discussions about infrastructure and future applications, certainly, as we go forward. So the bottom line is we've got many efforts underway to ensure the safe certification and integration of these vehicles and drones writ large. Now think again for a minute about those three interlocking circles and how they interact with each other. If this industry is gonna succeed, public acceptance will also, along with those, those interlocking circles, is gonna really be essential. The public has often been reluctant about drones for a variety of reasons including concerns about privacy, data, safety, and security. And sometimes there have been some negative reactions. Last month, for example, there was a news report about a, a state law enforcement official shooting a drone out of the sky. We just can't have stuff like that happening. Um, this industry should take the lead toward encouraging public acceptance, and we are working very hard with you on that. If, if people see that drones are uniquely beneficial to them, say for an elderly parent who can get groceries or machine or, uh, or medicine delivered, or for communities who can replant forests and fight wildfires. I mean, there, there's so many, uh, so many applications that we're all familiar with, then they're more likely uh, to accept uh, drones uh, as, a, as an integral part of our society. 
And of course, as we've said, there's been a lot of good news and a lot of innovation with applications to fight the, the uh, pandemic. Uh, UPS has recently started delivering COVID-19 vaccines in North Carolina. They, they utilize some temperature controlled packaging to keep the vaccine at the uh, proper temperature as it's transported from the hospital out to the, uh, the medical facilities where it will be administered. Wherever societal benefits from drones can be realized, it's up to all of us to help the public understand these benefits and connect with them. But the public has to believe us when we say that safety and security risks have been addressed. The BV Loss Arc will help inform those policy choices by documenting the benefits of drones to society. But please don't wait for the FAA to issue the rule. There's a lot that we can do now. Industry can help to take the lead by encouraging public acceptance now. Now on that note, uh, next week, remember, is National Drone Safety Awareness Week. It runs from September 13th through 19th, and it's a good chance for the industry to go into your communities to talk about drone safety and highlight the benefits of drones. You can find out more information and resources about National Drone Safety Week uh, uh, right uh, on the FAA's website. Also next week, September 14th and 15th, we're co-hosting episode four of the FAA's annual UAS Symposium. Episode four will focus on operational advancements, international developments, and BB loss operations. And you can find information on our website about the symposium as well. So to, to wrap up, uh, I'll just reiterate something that uh, probably some of you have heard me say before. Safety is a journey, not a destination. It's something that we always need to be focused on because if we don't, have safety, we don't have anything. And we, we have seen in aviation and in aerospace what setbacks there are uh, when we have an accident or incident. So we've always got to approach safety from a standpoint of humility, from a standpoint of managing risk, and really understanding what risks we are accepting as we move forward. Given the rat, rapid advancements that are happening uh, in the field, it's especially important that safety always remain the top priority, but certainly not a barrier to progress. This way, the innovation that we're seeing, such as the swarming drones from Georgia Tech or the vaccine delivery in North Carolina, will start to be everyday uh, types of applications. And they can grow safely, gain public acceptance, and deliver tremendous value as the United States continues to lead the aerospace sector uh, in the world. So, Thanks everyone uh, for your time, for your attention today, uh, for your leadership, and importantly, uh, for, for, uh, for being here today. I think it, it does speak very powerfully uh, that you are here uh, and, and ready to work with us. And uh, appreciate your passion uh, and your focus on safety, and we're right there with you. Thank you.